Good evening, everyone, and welcome to this evening's Pasture Project webinar, Options for Marketing Your Grass-Fed Beef and Dairy. We're glad that you could join us this evening uh, for tonight's webinar. We have three great presenters who are going to uh, share their experience and insights uh, on marketing their grass-fed products uh, through uh, various different ways and various different organizations. Uh, and we are certain that you will learn a lot and we are really grateful for your time and attention on tonight's webinar. So before we get started, just a quick note here uh, that the webinar tonight is brought to you by the Pasture Project, which is an initiative of the Wallace Center. So I want to introduce our presenters this evening. We have three great folks here that are going to join us and I'll run through and do uh, some bios in the order that they're going to be presenting. Uh, first up, we're joined by Rod Ofte. Uh, of Willow Creek Ranch and uh, Wisconsin Meadows Grass-Fed Beef Co-op. Sorry, Rod, I left the Wisconsin off that. Um, Rod leads the Pasture Project's work in the Kickapoo River watershed, and he's a member of our core team. He's also a fourth-generation farmer that operates a rotational grazing beef operation near Coon Valley, Wisconsin. He's a graduate of the Military, military Academy at West Point and has uh, done uh, military service and deployments in Western Europe, Eastern Europe, and the Middle East. He also has his MBA from Boston University and 25 years worth of experience in the food industry uh, in Europe, the Middle East, and Asia. Since 2007, he's been back uh, to his farming roots in the Driftless of Wisconsin near his family homestead in Coon Valley. He's currently the president of North Group Consulting and markets his finished cattle directly to consumers via the Wisconsin Grass-Fed Beef Cooperative. He, in his spare time, if he has any with all those things he's doing, Rod's a fisherman, hunter, and a dad to two girls. So Rod will be presenting first. We're also joined by Adam Wartheson, uh, who is the government relations manager for Crop Cooperative in Organic Valley. Uh, for the cooperative, he focuses on government affairs and provides support to various departments and farmers on organic food and farm programs, regulations, and advocacy campaigns. His duties include cultivating relations with policymakers and agency staff, as well as numerous organic food and farm stakeholders. Previous to coming to Crop in 2014, he worked for 12 years on food and farm policy for the Minnesota Nonprofit Land Stewardship Project. Uh, Adam serves on the Wisconsin Organic Advisory Council and holds a bachelor's in environmental studies with an emphasis on public policy from Bemidji State University. Uh, last but not least, we have Dorn Holm, who is the regional pool manager for Organic Valley. He lives between Menominee and Eau Claire, Wisconsin, and helps members of the producer pools at Organic Valley, mainly for dairy, but also for eggs, pork, and the growers uh, pool when needed. Doran is an avid intensive rotational grazer and he is also uh, does custom heifer raising for organic valley farmers on his organic pasture based farm which is just around the corner from uh, where I am here in Menominee, Wisconsin. So nice to have a neighbor here on our, uh, our webinar this evening. So those are our great presenters tonight. Uh, with that, we're actually going to transition over and start with Rod who's going to walk us through some of the uh, ins and outs of marketing grass-fed beefs. Welcome, everyone. Uh, thanks again for the introductions, Pete. Uh, my name is Rod Ofte, uh, General Manager of the Wisconsin Grass-Fed Beef Co-op. These are some of our employees at the beautiful uh, Willow Creek Ranch. Unfortunately, we've been pummeled by uh, our annual 500-year flood, and most of the grass you see here on the lower part, it's now rocks, but we'll work through that. Our co-op is uh, has about 189 uh, members. We've been in business for about 10 years, and uh, we're based in Vernon County, the same county as Organic Valley, who has a great uh, uh, cooperative history in our county and uh, really support the, the grass-fed movement in general uh, and, uh, and uh, uh, reviving rural uh, uh, Wisconsin farms. So let's first talk about uh, the grass-fed beef sector. Anytime before you'd want to enter into something that's uh, new for you or uh, simply different, you kind of want to understand how, how is the sector and is this a sector that I want to be involved in? Is it growing? Is it new? Is it challenging? Uh, what's going on? So the good news is the grass-fed beef sector is pretty promising. Um, first of all, grass-fed beef historically, um, when I'm out talking to customers and chefs and other folks in the industry, um, unfortunately, some of us have a job with grass-fed beef and uh, sometimes some chefs or other folks in retail call it grass-starved beef because they've had a really bad experience. And like many of us, if you have a bad experience, you don't go back to things. But the domestic grass-fed beef market in America now produces really outstanding beef. Uh, it's not uncommon for things 
to to be in the choice category, which on the USDA meat scale is very, very, uh, very strong, very um, high value meat um, category. But there's also a lot of programs that boast even getting into prime, which uh, five to 10 years ago was unheard of. So really high quality uh, growth in the domestic grass fed beef sector. Let's look at the value of the sector. If we were back in the 1930s, 1940s, you wouldn't want to be investing in domestic steel wheel production uh, when the, the car was booming. And, and similar to that, uh, grass-fed beef in 1998, not all that long ago, um, really only was about four to five million in retail value. So extremely small and really in, in the infancy of the industry. Fast forward about 20 years, um, it had grown to three plus billion in the U.S. Um, over 30 hundred uh, growers involved in growing annually at a strong double digit rate of 20 to 30 percent. Now the chip on my shoulder as a uh, American grass-fed beef producer is if you look at the imported versus domestic numbers about three quarters or 75 percent of what we consume as Americans as grass-fed beef is imported and that's an insult because we can make amazing grass-fed beef we can support rural economies we can support American farmers by uh, doing it right here, just as good, if not better, than other folks. So uh, there's a huge opportunity there if you look in the underlying numbers for us to take uh, take a larger share. Nevertheless, the market has reached about 7.2% uh, market share. Anytime uh, you're involved in the food industry, uh, if someone gets to 4, 5%, 1%, 2 3%, uh, the big players call that a niche, or they'll come and go, they'll be gone. And when you hit 5%, people really pay attention. And what's happened is at the 5% level, uh, the major packers like JBS started buying uh, regional or smaller grass-fed programs to kind of cover up their own imports and other things. And they said, hey, this is for real. This trend is for real. Uh, we need to get involved. So you'll see people like JBS now own Grassman Farms, which was a small Iowa family uh, operation, and then it's now a, a JBS brand. The, the good news for us as a, as a whole as grass-fed producers is the uh, the category is growing and we, uh, it's a strong thing to be taken part of. So many reasons to consider 100% uh, grass-based operation. So to qualify for grass-fed and 100% grass-fed, grass-finished, uh, you do need to be 100% grass-fed operation. Now, if you're a person that needs to have a lot of attention, if you like free hats, if you like free coats, if you like a lot of people visiting your farm, Grass-based operations, grass-based um, beef production is not for you. Sorry to give you the bad news. This is a picture of a typical grazer uh, out with his dog and checking on the cattle. Um, you, the only disadvantage of the whole operation is you're not very popular. So uh, you're not buying a lot of equipment, so the John Deere person's not visiting you. Um, you're not buying any pesticides, herbicides, seed, et cetera, et cetera. So there are some drawbacks, but uh, also a lot of positives. We'll move on to that. So first, as a, as a landowner and or farmer, especially we have a lot of young and beginning farmers on our call, you know, look at your options. Uh, you can do conventional, you can do better, faster, stronger, you can uh, fight for scale, or you can do things different. Um, one thing I, I looked at um, as if somebody getting back into my agricultural roots, these numbers come from the uh, Minnesota Corn Growers Association. So this isn't a you know a political grass guy peddling grass numbers. This these come from a you know a, a, a corn growing association. The point of this is not to bash conventional farmers. The, the point is the financial um, outcomes of conventional farming are are very non promising. Uh, and where where the numbers start getting green has to do with perennial cover, i.e., grass and or alfalfa and or finishing grass-fed beef. So if you just want to look at the numbers, despite what your passion is, you probably want to pursue something where you can be sustainable. Sustainable has a lot to do with the environment, but sustainable also has a lot to do with the financials. If you're not sustainable financially, you won't stay on your farm. So let's talk a bit about the definition of 100% grass-fed beef. Um, that's to a lot of us that are farmers, it's it's blatantly obvious. Um, I get a call at least once a week from people, mostly consumers, asking, well, what do you feed them in wintertime? Um, so if you're a consumer, I guess a crazy question, it is dried uh, grass-based forage. So either haylage or dried dried hay. But yes, they must, if you want to qualify to be 100% grass-fed beef in terms of a legal FSIS-approved uh, label, 
that needs to be 100% grass-based forage over the life of the animal. That means no corn at any time. Um, I have people in our co-op, um, well, it's just a few days of the corn or just a few weeks of corn isn't, isn't bad, right? No, no corn at any time. That's the promise you make to your end consumer. And that's the promise that we need to keep um, in terms of keeping your brand promise. <clears throat> So uh, we'll move on to the Wisconsin Grass-Fed Beef Co-op protocol. And the protocol is never, isn't right or wrong. It's just what your brand is, is your brand promise to your end consumer. Uh, somewhat unique, and many, many of these may be like uh, Organic Valley. Some of them are slightly different. Um, we do have a non-GMO uh, promise, which means uh, no GMOs are planted or used. Uh, we try to pursue a very heavy non-GMO claim, but because GMOs are so aggressive, they may even take over an organic planted species. So we simply settled for the no GMOs planted or used. We do have 100% no antibiotics policy. Um, do we have uh, folks in the co-op that uh, sway a little differently on this? Um, if somebody gets sick in our herd, uh, we'll, we'll treat them with antibiotics simply because I think we have the means to make their disease better or to treat it. And then we'll call them from the herd. Other folks try to use, you know, pure organic methods or other folks say, no, I'm not going to do anything and have to deal with those outcomes. That's kind of a personal choice. But the protocol does have a no antibiotic policy. We also have no growth hormones allowed. Um, so no implants or no ear shots or anything that uh, mess with the organic uh, growth hormone system that, that make the animals grow faster. We also have a no pesticide and herbicide policy. Um, Again, this is just the choice of the grass-fed beef co-op that you don't have any you know, to spray any pesticides or herbicides on your fields and or, uh, or, or, and or cattle. Lastly, we have a, a pretty strict animal welfare criteria. So you might say, you know, this has nothing to do with grass rod, but for a lot of our folks, I'm not joking, but a lot of people that we sell to and that are really our hardcore uh, customer group are uh, what I call recovering vegetarians. So people that have said you know no to beef because they don't believe in the way beef are treated in the conventional system and i i, I gotta say i can understand where they're coming from but if you treat animals in a respectful way and they always have access to the outdoors fresh water fresh feed and they're they're uh, treated respectfully um a lot of people can you know understand uh, the consumption of protein again so we do have a strict animal welfare policy what that means for us is that they're never confined so they have the ability to wander, uh, have fresh water, fresh feed, all, uh, 365, 24-7. And then we also strive to naturally wean. That's a bit more of a vague criteria, but natural weaning is uh, we try to do nose-to-nose -nose weaning. We try to do it naturally, meaning 8 to 11 months. Um, at some stage, you're always going to have that animal that's going to try to you know suck until it's uh, two years old. Uh, but, but a natural weaning in 8 to 11 month uh, time frame is what we strive for. So if you do decide to take the jump and produce 100% grass-fed beef, it does take longer. You want to probably want to have some good genetics. You want to probably invest in feed. Uh, where can you sell this? Uh, obviously, you want, uh, want an outlet for the product that you're making. So first is, uh, is direct marketing. Uh, you can't turn the New York Times or any other uh, documentary or news source with without reading about the benefits of grass-fed beef almost every day. Omega-6s, omega-3s, CLAs, all very positive uh, direct marketing which should help you in the valuation of your product. So direct marketing, farmers markets, people are looking for, for grass-fed beef. So that, that's always an uh, opportunity. The negative with grass uh, direct marketing is it's extremely time consuming. You have to develop a brand, spending your weekends at farmers markets, da 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 da. Now the nice thing is you you can get a premium there, but it's, again, it's extremely time consuming. You can join cooperatives uh, and be a member owner, like Organic Valley is an amazing organization. They're based right here in Vernon County, Wisconsin, and, and our grass-fed grass beef co-op is based right here in Vernon County, Wisconsin. So as a co-op uh, uh, owner member, uh, you're a voter. You're, you're talking about pay price. You're at the meetings, and you control. Uh, you're not just serving a, a larger corporation, but you're actually an, an active member owner, which is a, a great organization. There are is uh, third alternatives. There's some branded programs, and I must say there are some good ones. They're, they're good competitors out there. 
uh, Thousand Hills uh, Cattle Company. Uh, they're based in Minnesota. They buy cattle from uh, Midwest all the way to the West Coast. <clears throat> um, they're competitive in terms of their their uh, their fees that they pay. Um, you know, again, honestly, the only fallback there is you're not a member owner. You know, if they have a great year, that goes to their corporate. Uh, coffers, which uh, they, I think they intentionally did do good things with. Nevertheless, you know, it's not a cooperative per se. Lastly, I encourage people to be 100% grass-fed beef because the traditional channels, though you're not going to get what you would um, in a grass-fed supported channel, um, when I've had to sell a, a feeder animal or some other animals that <clears throat> I had to give antibiotics to and I couldn't eat them, I just had to sell them at a traditional sales barn, They've done quite well. I think good grass-fed beef genetics, a solid animal that's healthy, um, it gets a high price in traditional channels. So again, worst case, if you have to fall back to that, uh, even to the sending it down to the sales barn, uh, good grass-fed genetics get a good price at the sales barn too. So another, another thing to think about. So the grass-fed beef premiums that are available, uh, the Wisconsin Grass-Fed Beef Co-op uh, does uh, not only offer but but is uh, committed to as our mission to get a 20 percent plus premium to conventional beef uh, what we do at our annual meetings is we take um, conventional beef prices we add 20 um, percent to it and ensure our pay price is always well above that so um, that's uh, you know that's that's a good reason to join a co-op grass-fed Finished premiums in general uh, in the direct marketing area are uh, traditionally 25 plus, um, so that's very common. So another good reason to to jump into that arena. And then lastly, uh, implementation of rotational grazing principles allows you to get more production from the same land base. So I come from a conventional dairy background. Um, I started reading about uh, grass-fed rotational grazing and just the idea that 30% to 40% more production from the same land base by letting grass rest just captured me. And it was enamored me and I started pursuing it. And you, you fall in love and start to becoming a uh, study of the whole concept. And it really takes you uh, and then you don't go back. Um, other benefits of rotational grazing, uh, improved animal health. Um, you find out if you do rotational graze, they're always going into fresh pastures. You don't need to have porons, you don't need to have fly control, all these other, what I, we call crutches, they really fall out of place. That's important not only because of animal health and environmental health, but be, it's also important because that reduces your inputs. If you're not buying all these lick tubs and sprays and other things that you don't need, reducing your inputs, especially in a cow-calf operation, uh, can be a make or break. Uh, again, you, may, you get improved pasture production, letting your grasses rest, let, ensuring that you have a really strong um, uh, improved soil and improved root system, uh, your improved uh, forage production really sets you apart from uh, set stock grazing. Um, the next one, I really like uh, you can do it non full time. You don't have to be uh, all in uh, the farmer or rancher. Uh, if you work in town, or you just want to get started, or you're taking over the family farm, you can do rotational grazing and you can have a beef operation without the commitment that's required from dairy. I don't want to scare away any of the dairy folks, but you, know, you can have an in-town job, have a few head on your your ranch and, and move them around uh, non-full-time, which I think is a huge, huge attraction. Uh, a negative quickly there, you are going to have to fence. If you don't have good fence, you'll want fence. Uh, and with rotational uh, grazing principles, you're going to need to have quite a bit of fence, including temporary fence, in order to to pursue and make sure that your cattle are making good gains. So um, you're going to need to invest in that. Uh, that said, there are quite a few cost, cost share alternatives that you can pursue and look into to offset those costs. Um, can't go through this whole spiel without, you know, talking a bit about the environmental benefits of rotational grazing. I'm not a tree hugger by any means, but when you see these things in action, uh, it's really, really impressive. So by letting the soil rest and by letting the cattle you know, spread the manure naturally, you can actually improve your soil health, improve your organic matter, and create topsoil, which is which is huge. Living in a place where we just had a massive flood, reducing erosion um, by improving your soil health and improving your root systems is a, is a very positive thing. Uh, improving your water retention or uh, drought abatement. So 
when you let your pastures rest, you get more water retention and others are suffering from a drought, your plants are gonna to continue to be healthy because you don't overgraze them and that you uh, allow more water to penetrate uh, to the root system. Improved water quality, if you don't have a lot of exposed soil, you have good solid uh, root systems that are allowing water to infiltrate, you're gonna have less runoff and cleaner water in your streams. Uh, you're gonna have natural, better uh, plant diversity. Um, you're gonna have some forbs, what some people call weeds, but allowing those, uh, both the forbs, the, the legumes and the grasses, warm and cool season, uh, they'll all thrive under a rotational grazing system. And then unlike most people think, uh, you know, when they think grazing, they think really short pastures. Uh, rotational grazing is a very diverse pastures, which are really fundamental to good wildlife habitat. And that also thrives. You can have the win-win of a good cattle production facility operation and also uh, good wildlife habitat. So some challenges, uh, everything's not roses in life, uh, as we all know. Uh, there are conversion and setup costs, especially if you are um, going from a row crop operation to something where you wanna produce a bunch of forage. Year one, you're gonna probably have to, you know, till that up, uh, put in some cover crops, uh, some, some uh, a mix of both rye, alfalfa, warm, cool season grasses. Those seeds cost money. It costs money to plant that, and, and it takes time for them to come up. So there are some conversion and setup costs you need to be aware of. If you are going to go organic, as we did when we first did this, uh, um, you're going to have a certification time. Uh, often that is three years. If you just take, uh, if you know that there were uh, sprays on the land beforehand, you have to certification time. And there's also some money with. Uh, um, you know, a, a applying for those certifications uh, in the meantime. So be aware of that and understand the time it takes to get there. If you are buying a, buying land that the previous owner will say that there's never been any uh, sprays, pesticides, herbicides, et cetera, you can use a an accelerated form, which is called a PLUD form, uh, prior land use declaration form, and you can transition that uh, land to organic much faster. So keep that in mind. Um, my biggest issue as a beef producer is that, you know, from an animal, animal husbandry perspective was learning to get by without the crutches. Uh, probably four years ago was the, uh, the first time I could get by without uh, putting some kind of pour on our cows. And uh, to, you know, to think, well, cows can't get by without a natural dewormer. They really can. And the sooner you get yourself to look in the mirror and understand that they, they can do that, uh, it's very, very important because otherwise you're really not qualifying for these programs and you're, you're your system. If you don't get the genetics and the animals that'll get by without the crutches, you won't be successful. From a planning perspective, it is important to understand that you're going to have a cash flow lag. So if, if you go, you know, full hog into a, a grass-fed beef production tomorrow, and maybe you buy the land and you take what, the time to get the land ready, and you buy genetics, and, and then you want to do a cow calf, and you want to finish your own stuff. It takes probably 24 months to finish a good grass-fed steer, even with good genetics. Uh, and if you're grazing that from a calf, it takes another, you know, nine to 12 months. So the point there is you need to make sure you have a plan, a business plan that allows for a two to three year cash for leg before you have any kind of production. Um, if you do that, you'll be fine. If you don't, then you all of a sudden need money to pay the bills. Maybe your farm will not be sustainable, so be careful. And lastly, ensure you have grass-fed based genetics. Um, the Genetics that finish well on grass are more traditional genetics. They're more smaller framed animals, so a three to four frame beef animal, uh, something that's not really tall, not really conventional, because they're made to convert grass to energy and that energy into fat and muscle, uh, and they have to be efficient. So make sure you have grass-based genetics, not just something that you read about, not just something that you saw, and please, 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 not something that you just say, oh, I had a, I got a great deal on these. I got a great deal on these Holstein heifers. You know, if they're a six, seven frame Holstein animal, they're not a beef genetics, they're not, not gonna finish on grass. So uh, please uh, save yourself that challenge. So with that, I'll show you my favorite superhero who turns grass into steaks and uh, challenge you to what your superpower is and, and hand it off to my friends at Organic Valley. Great. Thanks, Rod. I appreciate that presentation there. Um, but with that, we'll move on to our next presenters. Again, we're uh, joined by Adam Wartheson and Doran Holm from Organic Valley. Uh, we'll pass it off to you, uh, Adam, so that you can um, 
share us a little bit more about grass-fed dairy. Okay. Well, Rob and um, Pete, thanks for having us on. Um, we appreciate the Pastor Project uh, carrying out this body work. I want to start out just saying a little bit about who Organic Valley is. Myself and Doran Homer are going to walk through the presentation, but um, Organic Valley, we're a cooperative that was founded in 1988, um, and uh, we have about 2,000 farmer members, and I believe about four different pool, well, six different pools um, of farmers where we aggregate their product and help market it for them. We're best known as, as probably people recognize with that with a logo there for our dairy products, which you you find in a lot of different um, locations around the country. Uh, in terms of grass-fed, so in addition to organic, we do have a sort of, I guess you could call it a diet claim that we use in, in, a, in a product line called grass milk, um, and it's a grass-fed dairy. And we're going to talk about um, sort of some trends in grass-fed uh, dairy and also a little bit about standards and productions and how those are similar yet maybe different from beef. Um, in terms of the, the marketplace for us, you know, for our grass-fed um, milk, um, we both sell uh, branded product, which is grass milk, but we also sell ingredient products to folks that want to use, um, you know, let's just make it up a, a, um, a dry milk powder and put it into a product line and, have, and use it as a grass milk um, and make a grass-fed claim on that. Um, so if we look at sort of some of the trends, um, I want to talk a little bit about that. Grass-fed, at least in, in both in, in dairy and in beef, has been on the rise. And this is some data from 2016. Um, and these are sort of some, some arenas where that was demonstrated. We had Whole Foods um, put grass-fed in their top 10. You had Forbes, um, you know, um, I think... Um, noting the similar growth that Rob did in his presentation, the 25 to 30%. Um, the fancy uh, winter fancy food show in the top and the top five, and even more conventional streams um, like the Milk Marketing Board, recognizing grass fed in dairy as a growing um, category. Um, you know, overall, it's, it's still pretty small. You know, organic is about all, of all dairy is about eight percent of the market, and grass fed's a much much smaller piece of that. Um, the next slide I'm just going to show is a little bit of growth by the numbers. This is close to where Rob numbers were as well. The grass fed claims growing at about forty percent, and it's interesting when you look at grass fed. You wonder, well, what is the what is the consumer's interest in grass fed? Why is that? And it has to do in part with um, how they think about what 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 they want to purchase with their dollar and it's both um you know uh, animals on pasture and it's usually sort of a family um, farm orientation that is sort of conjured up in their minds and then you also have people that are looking at the the nutritional attributes of food i know uh, we we heard a little bit about um the omega six to three balance which has to do with your cardiac health and pulmonary benefits um, and then your conjugate linoleic acids, which um, I'm not going to pretend to know anything about all that, but I'm told it's an anti-cancer and anti-inflammatory sort of um, need that your body needs in a fat. Um, if you look at this slide, it just shows also, you know, those two other areas that we just talked about that are related to grass fed is pasture raised, right? That's grown 24% and animal welfare, which how those animals cared for typically not in a confinement operation that consumers are really interested in seeing those sales growth have been about 23 percent. Um, so I want to just talk a little bit about how grass-fed in dairy is different because um, I think as we think about this sector as Rob put it it gives us a little bit of understanding. So in, in grass-fed dairy you have a, right now a lot of wide-ranging claims and we did a collection of this in at the co-op here, everything from grass to glass people are using in marketing to we're grass fed from international. Um, and in a lot of ways they can say that because 
dairy cattle in some way or fashion typically have a ration that provides some grass in it, right? Um, so using grass fed is, is, uh, has been used a lot and our concern has been for those that are truly grass fed in the 100% sort of vein and in similar to what Rob talked about and we'll talk about our standard, but that, you know, no grain, um, that there's an animal welfare check, um, you know, for us, it's everything above organic in a feeding claim that, that we're, we're losing sort of that space if, if it's sort of bombarded by subpar claims. The other thing to note is that um, dairy labeling is usually in the, in the world of states and or FDA, the Food and Drug Administration. And Food and Drug Administrations is largely, you know, products cannot be, uh, they need to be truthful and not misleading. So that's not a really uh, there's not a lot of strength there. Um, I'm not pretending that the Food Safety and Inspection Service has a lot of, uh, the, which is under USDA and sort of sets the expectation for grass-fed beef. They don't do enforcement on that um, like you would on, you know, an organic certified claim, but it at least has sort of a expectation if you're going to make the claim on, 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 um, on meat because FSIS oversees both meat and eggs. Uh, the other thing that I would just note is there's a prevalence of dairy and, and branded product categories. So you have you have grass-fed milk, you have grass-fed cheese, you have grass-fed yogurt, you have gra and and um, you know you have grass-fed uh, half and half. So we just have a lot of product areas that are somewhat different than dairy. The other thing to recognize in dairy, and we'll get into this a little bit, is the energy needs for a dairy cow are different than those for a um for a beef cow or or you know a steer that's going to slaughter in two years so there's just some considerations on how do you make sure those animals stay healthy and it's a real big concern that we have in terms of animal welfare and animal care is how do you make sure you have the management techniques and abilities to do that on a farm not every farm can be a grass-fed farm um, and we really need to sort of uh, make sure those that are going into that space are doing it not for just a, a premium pay price, but because they've got the abilities. Um, I want to just speak to this last piece, uh, it's, which has just come up most recently, is some lawsuits. So we just saw a lawsuit come out of California where Kerrygold, who is a, um, a company, uh, a branded product out of Ireland, is being challenged um, for misrepresenting its feed to cows um, because it makes a grass-fed claim. And then you, know, you can read in the bottom paragraph there that um, it, where it's false and misleading. So this company, this, this class section is being brought against this company on their existing claim. So we're really in the space of now wanting to make sure that, you know, we're in a strong position in, in marketing our products and that we're you know, meeting those expectations. This comes out of California, which has some unique ways that um, uh, class actions can come forward. It's just the way that they're they're structured. Uh, I want to take a minute and let Doran maybe talk a little bit about our program. He he works a lot with our farmer members, and probably can tell 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 folks best about sort of what's it look like on the ground, and and talk a little bit about our pay price and in our number of farms. Sure. Thanks, Adam. I hope everybody can hear me okay. Um, it was cutting out a little bit, but uh, hopefully you hear me fine. Uh, I first I just want to say, yes, I'm Doran Holm. I've been with Organic Valley about 13 years uh, on staff, uh, helping to uh, helping our membership in my role as a person out on the ground, out in the field, and I was a producer with Organic Valley before that. Our farm was kind of a startup. It was a startup first generation and kind of a project for my children, for my wife and I to have our kids uh, just learn the value of working on a farm and with cattle. And it was a tremendous experience. And we actually still have a couple of young children that even though we're not milking cows right now, we'd maybe like to do it again for the two younger children we have that uh, should would benefit from the same experience. Um, so yeah, the grass milk program, um, Really, I think it, its genesis at our co-op started just uh, with one of our members who lives about an hour north of me. Uh, you know, I'm in, I'm about an hour east of St. Paul, Minnesota, 
and then this person is about an hour north of me, uh, Cheyenne Christensen, maybe a name people have heard of, but he uh, such a pioneer in so many things organically, and um, and one was that way before anybody else, he seemed to be a person that was feeding no grain to his uh, to his dairy cattle and making it work, and um, so people start and and for a long time saying we should have this type of product, and and I have to say I was I was uh, I was a pessimist thinking well that's how would we ever pull that off? Well, as time went off. Our time went on, and we, uh, you know, we uh, thought of maybe how we could do it, and develop these specialized routes, you know, with enough, uh, I guess, inertia, and with membership to get it going. Um, we uh, went from, you know, Cheyenne and maybe a dozen others to 168 farms in the last few years, which is about one tenth of our membership, which which represents basically about six percent of our milk supply. Because it tends to be that you know, we have about 1,600 dairy farmers in our co-op out of 2,000 members, because the other members are in other pools like pork and eggs and beef. But of the 100 uh, or the 1,600 members, we got about 10% of them doing grass milk now, and um, and we're making it work. And it's it's a popular brand. I eat grass milk yogurt every day for breakfast, and. Um, and it's a very delicious product in case you ever want to try it. Um, what we offered to the members at first was a $3 premium. We, you know, they're paid by 100 weight, and our typical pay, our pay price right now is probably about $23, $24 per 100 weight for our regular organic milk. And, and then we had that $3 premium, which as the years have gone on, we upped that two more dollars. So it's $4 premium. On the regular on the regular paycheck, but then the fifth dollar is is given to them um, by if they show that they purchase some amendments for their soils, they get their soils tested, see where maybe they're out of balance, get some recommendations from we have a staff agronomist or another agronomist, and then put those amendments on. You know maybe they get a buggy or two of uh, of amendments and it costs them four thousand dollars. Over a year's time, that dollar reimbursement may just about cover the cost of, of those fertilizer inputs. So, really trying to make sure that the grass milk farmer is getting their, um, you know, their these amendments on and having the best balanced soils they can have, very well mineralized, because everything's got to come, you know, out of there versus trying to supplement them with, you know, a little corn. And I will say on behalf of all of our other members, the other, you know, the remaining 1,600 members, uh, 1,400 or so that are, that are uh, not grass milk, we are a low grain uh, membership, you know, but uh, and most of our membership who do feed grain feed very, very little. Uh, corn is expensive and they just believe in the, the high forage diet. But anyway, when you're trying to get everything out of your own soil, it's got to, you know, have those soils just right. And then you need to, uh, of course, the timing of, of putting up your forage is, got, is just critical. And that can be a real challenge. You know, if we want to talk about what some of the challenges are, um, you know, a lot of our grass milk farmers are smaller farmers. Like I said, they, they're 10% of our membership, but only really 6% of our milk. They tend to really be, you know, a lot of them are, you know, 30 to 50 cow dairies, uh, where our, our average membership is around more like about 75 to 80 cows dairies and um, so it's tough for that farmer to have the equipment that's needed and sometimes you maybe aren't working with the best equipment that can move over a lot of acres fast and put up feed fast or you're relying on custom harvesters and then you're kind of at the mercy of their schedule um, but so it's real important to put up good quality feed you know very timely and um, and uh, of course, you know, try to avoid the rains and baleage is real common. And yet, people would like to try to, you know, make some dry hay too, and maybe second or third crop when it, you know rain is maybe not so prevalent as early in the year, and uh, and get that up, get that put up well, and uh, and then if you um, you know put your feed samples to our nutritionist 
or a nutritionist. We have an on-staff nutritionist, which works very close with our gas milk farmers. But uh, then, then take whatever the recommendations are from the nutritionist and balance that ration to the needs of an animal so they get all the energy they need you know, to uh, have a balanced ration and, and stay in good health and also produce some milk. And uh, our own staff nutritionists would say that, that's Dr. Sylvia Abel Keynes, that you know what she sees as far as the best produce, people having the best outcomes are those that will blend, continuously blend in, um, you know, maybe the feed they make, but maybe some feed they purchase. You know, we have a grower pool, a pool of producers that just grow feed for our other members and grow very high quality feed. Sometimes you, quite frankly, it's almost kind of, it's not impossible, it's a quite a challenge to grow the same feed in western Wisconsin that you can grow in western Minnesota or, you know, the Dakotas and to pick up some of that feed and blend it in with what you have to have a really good, um, you know, ration for your your grass milk animal is, is really, really a good way to do things. And, you know, we did have um, a, uh, you know, when we started the program, you could feed your younger, your young stock some grain, but we've transitioned away from that to where, you know, now, if it isn't now, it's coming here in the next couple of months that all of our, Adam can maybe correct me or, or clarify on it, but that all animals of all ages um, are completely on grass, or no grain, all ages. So um, I think if I maybe covered the pay price there, so basically the pay price is whatever our pay price is for our other members, plus $5, the final dollar, the five um, in amendment reimbursement. The uh, animal care requirements, I really, I, I just wanna give some uh, recognition to what Rod presented, really nice presentation about the requirements for animal care and, and the soils and such too is pretty much something I don't need to repeat verbatim, but, but that, uh, is pretty much what we need to do as well. Um, I'll just take a minute here to look at a couple of my notes. I just heard about this webinar yesterday, so I wasn't well, really prepared. Well, let me, let me add to that. One of the things, Doran, that we offer and for those listening in is um, our team does a, a, a an animal care audit every year on each grass-fed farm to check the condition of those uh, animals and make sure that they're in, in health, and we keep that on, on file. We're in the process, and why um, Doran said he, I maybe could give some insights. We're in the process right now, actually, of building out a more substantial certified grass-fed program, and that certified grass-fed program is going to be an industry-wide program that we will put in place with a couple of other companies um, that'll be relying on the certification strength of organic certifiers, but sort of the bolt-on of what does it really mean to be grass fed? And I'll talk a little bit more about that. One of those aspects is the care of those calves. And, and this is where dairy and beef are a little different. We have some, um, uh, you know, cause you're milking cows for their milk to sell. So you're oftentimes removing those calves fairly early on in their lives. Um, so there's some supplementation that's happened traditionally. And now we're looking at making that more grass fed the whole way through. So, um, Doran, do you want to speak at all about um, the protocols for our existing grass milk in terms of what they're, they're fed or what can, they can't be fed? Did I lose Doran? Yeah, I couldn't get off mute, but I'm off now, so. Yeah, um, yeah, well, basically it has to be um no grain and so getting back to what i was saying earlier it's great uh, emphasis you know people try to have a what's real common with our grass milk farms is you'll 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 be harvesting mechanically off of the same fields that you tend to i'm not exclusively but a lot of what you graze is also harvested mechanically um as grass comes flying up early in the year you know, you'll sw you'll have your cattle grazing on part of the farm, and then you swipe off part, and uh, and so that feed tends to be a a, a blend. You know, of maybe thirty percent legumes, 
you know, seventy percent grass, but a diverse diverse mix sometimes up to seventeen different types of grasses and legumes in that in that mix. That works well both for grazing and for um, for harvesting. And then there's some annuals, some annuals that people will try, but those can be real susceptible to the weather, you know, hot or cold. And I don't have a lot of experience with them personally. I, I haven't grown any, but sorghum sedans and sorghums. But you, you, it just can't be anything that grows any sort of a grain um, or a head to it, um, or a, a grain grain head. Um, again, on the dairy side, um, molasses is allowed and and I think encouraged, uh, especially in the winter. Uh, maybe a little liquid molasses. Uh, I've really only known of one lick available that now I hear it's not going to be available, but if uh, to just give a little more energy along with, you know, high quality, maybe an alfalfa that is bought in, you know, is really helpful. But it, there ain't, I, there's really not a lot to say about it because there isn't much that can be fed besides forage. Uh, summer or winter, it has to be, it has to be uh, grass. Um, <coughs> I think I wanted to mention too is that we, you know, we only consider just, I don't want to get hopes up for maybe somebody listening who's like, oh, we are doing a little grass dairy, um, maybe we become part of Organic Valley, and maybe you can. It's just, um, and when we think about the people listening to this thing and what your marketing opportunities are, your options for marketing your grass fed beef and or dairy, well, we do have a, you know, we do have a, a beef pool, but, um, uh, at this point, it's not it's not completely grass fed, so you may be more inclined to work with with Rod and and his his group, uh, at least in the Midwest or however far they cover. But when we have grass milk farmers that actually cover the whole United States, we started out in California, and then we started up in the Midwest, then we moved to the Far East, and then the Mid East, and then the Northwest part of the United States. Just recently, just this year, and um, and where we get our members from for grass milk is from our own membership. So basically to get into grass milk with Organic Valley, to begin in, into that carton or that block of cheese that's grass milk from Organic Valley, you already have to be an Organic Valley member. And then what we look for is membership, members that express interest in it. We don't ever talk anybody into it. Uh, but we, if people start coming to us about it, which happens to me all the time, because I'm one of those people on the ground that does the audits, does the body scoring, you know, um, you know, looking at the animals and and uh, their uh, dry matter intake and their, you know, I go through a big process. I just finished my last one for this year, yesterday, and that's about a two-hour sit down at the kitchen table, and then we go out another hour and a half looking at everybody, all the animals of all ages. But that's only within our co-op. I mean, we we'll have members that may say to us, you know, I feed you know seven or eight pounds of grain to my Holsteins, and they're looking at grass milk. It's like they're a long way away from being a grass milk. Yet yeah, we've had other members that were 12 years grass milk and just didn't have access to that market logistically. And then finally, as we grew the program, we could get them into that. Uh, program and that premium that they've already been doing it for so many years, but they they had no premium for it. They just did it because that's they want the way they want to manage, and that's something I really want to emphasize is that uh, you know uh, I guess when it comes to the challenges and opportunities of grass milk in our co-op is you know why do people want to do it? Well, it, it can be a number of things that drives a farmer to it. it First of all, they're just not a machinery driver. We have, there's, there's a couple different types of farmers out there. There's those that really like to, you know, stroke, you know, the neck of their cows, and there's others that like to stroke the fender of their tractor, you know, or be pictured by the cow or take their picture by the tractor. And uh, we have both type of farmers in our co-op. And uh, there's people who like to grow corn, and they, they live on land where it's good to grow corn. Then we have members that are in places where, you know, the ground is hilly and rocky and, and uh, and and uh, lighter soil and it's good grazing ground or higher further north, and um, and you know the time it takes to grow corn, the risk involved in growing corn, the equipment investments, you know, um, and, or the price to buy it. These are all things that can drive a person, and just they don't have interest in running equipment that can drive someone 
you know, towards the interest in grass milk, and they just want to be more involved with the cattle. Uh, herd health too, of course. Uh, you know, cattle, cattle on low grain can be very are very very healthy cattle, but um, you know, there's obviously if you push the grain too much, you're going to have herd health issues. So, and I will say too that in my observations over the last few years, doing these annual uh, body scorings and such, is that even our our farmers that you know were low grain and then went to no grain, you could see you know the the cattle go through this change and it's metabolic. You know, it's just like one of us saying, you know what, I'm cutting sugar out of my diet, you know, and and uh, it's going to change things for you for a while, and you're going to go through a withdrawal, and you can see the cattle go through that, and then they they may, you know, be a little thinner for the first year, but it's amazing, and the, as the time goes on, as you come back and score those cattle year after year to see those cattle uh, rebuild their body condition and, uh, and, and regain their milk uh, output, too. So it's been pretty neat, and it's very encouraging for for the members too. Who, you know, because we did have a few that you know uh, transitioned to it and then went back to feeding grain again, which is fine, and they're low grain. But uh, and then they look at it again, thinking maybe I should try it again, and maybe they tried it too quick, and they try to get some more education on it, maybe change up their cattle a little bit. Although, who I mentioned early on, Shane Christensen, he's a Holstein herd, although he has, you know built his herd over the years, you know, and for strength in that Frisian type of Holstein and uh, and does all that keeps a home herd. It, it's all within his own. Uh, he doesn't bring in other bulls. It's been pretty amazing for, for what he's done, but he does it with Holstein. So it can be done with just about any type of cow with, with really good management. We're always trying to strive with all of our farmers for continuous improvement, and I will say you know, the, it was a new venture for us, and uh, it's pretty neat to see the the improvement the farmers have have experienced. Well, well as Doran is it works on the ground with with farmers day in day out. One of the things we're able to do as the co-op, and I just have a real quick slide up on this, and we'll move through so we can take a few questions. Is as the co-op, we're able to actually look at the milk and test it. And one of the things we found is we look at the trends in 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 grass-fed products, and I mentioned. Um, uh, the nutrition that is provided. We're really excited to be able to find when we test our grass milk and we did a thousand samples of it, these, you know, 147% more omega-3s and you look at um, the CLAs, 125% more CLAs and that balance of um, six to three is pretty, uh, uh, is like one to one, which is provides a much healthier diet. Um, so these are kind of the pieces that we've been able to find and it is is a marketing cooperative, the things that we're able to tell consumers, you know, here's in part of the reason why, you know, you could consider our milk as, as um, really nutritious. You know, you'd think to boost your, your omega balances or CLAs, you know, the best way to do this, I think many of us know is to eat salmon, right? Or to eat uh, fish, but in the Midwest and or in the American diet, tend to eat meat and dairy products. And so this is potentially a, a an alternative dairy product that can be really beneficial. Some of these same numbers play out in beef as well. I don't have those stats, uh, but maybe Rob and, or, or Pete do. I'm gonna just um, jump back to the uh, presentation and I just wanted to walk through one of the things that we're doing and what Dorn and me have largely been describing is our internal grass milk program what he does with farmers and the marketing that we do and put on our products but we're not as a co-op and, and as a, a leader in the good food movement we want to see grass fed succeed across the country within the dairy sector and so we've looked at um, pulling together a, a set of companies um, and, and actors to develop a a uh, certified grass-fed standard that lives outside of just our own internal audit mechanisms. So we've worked, we're working with another company called um, Maple Hill, which is 100% grass-fed organic line, um, Pennsylvania Certified Organic, which is a certifier, um, NOFA New York, which is also a certifier, uh, and these are certifiers for organic, and then Earth Claims, which is um, another verification, a company that does verification. And so we've uh, developed, and it's in the handouts there, uh, a new program that is going to have a standard and going to be um, 
offered in 2019 that anyone can participate in in the dairy sector. Um, and it has it's a specific diet claim. And you know, as Dorn said, it'll be similar to what our diet is a no grain. It'll have an animal um, welfare verification component to it. But we are also putting metrics on how much are your animals gaining sustenance off of pasture because of it's being so important. So we're requiring a, a 60% dry matter intake in 150 days. And um, the other thing that's important to us in looking at um, a standard, and this is part where we differ in dairy again, is FSIS, like I said, has sort of a, an expectation of what it means to be um, grass-fed. And there are other certifications out there for grass-fed uh, beef. In dairy, there's really not much that exists currently. So building this provides a third party uh, verification. So it'll more or less, the, there will be an entity that owns and controls the standard with these actors I just suggested and potentially a bunch of others. Then any company could license that, that um, use of that, but they will have to have their producers um, certified to the standard. And the certifiers will be um, those that will be certifying are going to be accredited. So already those that are in the organic certifying world, any that want to pick up this additional business can be accredited and then provide that inspection on both the farm and both at the processing facility. So it's through the entire chain. You might think, well, why do you gotta, why do you need to um, certify a processing facility? It's largely a segregation question that we need to maintain um, through through all the way to the consumer. And milk, that's uh, pretty common. In the, we'll also have a seal that'll go along with this. And here's an example of what that seal will look like. Um, we're continuing to kind of work on the edges of this. This is sort of our um, best example of that. We have to do some walkthroughs with the National Organics Program and, and a few other folks, but this is kind of that outline. You know, as we think about, um, you know, marketing that question i mean the things that we what i would put forward in terms of you're thinking about marketing grass-fed products join a co-op that would be the first thing that i would point to because you know these are good examples of co-ops and we've had both successful programs i do believe uh the third-party verification is going to be continue to be an important piece um not only the the claim in and of itself, the diet claim and the and animal, animal raising claim, but also the, the merit of the verification itself. There are all kinds of different verification methods out there. Some are sampling programs, some are first party, some are second party, but we've really looked at third party verification. We think that's really important. Um, and then I guess the other thing I would say is just, um, and I think it's been spoke to really well on this uh, webinar is you need to provide a quality product whether that's beef or dairy and you need to really focus on providing that quality product and it, and it may lag before you before you nail it uh, you know out of the park and you will have to continually learn about that uh, and how to how to meet that um, those specs that you want so with that I want to thank folks and um, I guess we can take a few questions yeah, absolutely. Thanks, Adam and Dorm. That's uh, it was helpful. I'm gonna just switch back over here to our main presentation, and uh, and we will take a few questions now. So uh, as we kind of uh, move in this direction to Q and A for folks, just another reminder and plug that if you haven't already and you have a question, use the control panel, submit your question. We want to make sure that we uh, get to as many questions as we can here in the next 10 to 15 minutes. Uh, and uh, now's a good time to submit that. So again, use your control panel to get to that question section. So uh, to start us off, uh, we have quite a few that have come in, uh, and uh, I'll try to direct them to our presenters as is appropriate. Uh, the first one I think um, would more focus more on uh, a question for you, Rod, and specifically in regard to uh, how the co-op uh, Wisconsin Meadows Breastfed Beef Co-op operates. There's a question here around around slaughter and, and facilities, and curious about um, you know how the co-op navigates some of those bottlenecks in terms of consistently ensuring that product reaches shelves, 
and what that means for crossing state lines when, uh, you know, Wisconsin Meadows, but, you know, potentially processing in Minnesota. How does the co-op deal with those bottlenecks and how does the co-op deal with marketing and clarity and marketing when it comes to uh, the various regulations that are out there? Yeah, thanks, Pete. Excellent question. I can tell whoever asked that has uh, dealt with that challenge. So we take it on uh, kind of a, with a two-prong attack. Um, we do use a, a USDA facility, which allows us excellent uh, packaging quality, excellent, excellent HACCP compliance, uh, and excellent consistency. We also use a state plant uh, in Wisconsin that is able to do much more flexible uh, uh, detailed things for us that our federal plan can do. So I know it sounds confusing and it was a challenge for us to get there, but it's, it's a really a perfect combination for us. So 90%, uh, 85% of our business goes through this, the uh, federal plant, which then can go from there to all these distributors uh, across state borders. Uh, the state plant does all of our custom work. Uh, we still think it's very valuable to interact directly with a customer allow them to cut a half a beef any way they want it. Uh, and as complex as that business is, it's our highest margin business because we span the full breadth from slaughter to end, uh, end purchase. So uh, yeah, hopefully that answered the question. We do both uh, and we use the state plant for really detailed uh, custom things and other small details stuff within state. And then anything that's shipped out of state is done by our federal plant. Great. Thanks, Rob. That was good. Uh, here's, a, here's a question uh, for Adam and Dorn, um, and it also, I think, could get a response from you as well, Rod, because I think it's broadly applicable to uh, both beef and dairy, um, especially from you know, the, the co-op or the aggregator perspective. Um, the question is asking, you know, with working with a lot of different producers who may be working with different breeds or different genetics, on different pastures and different places and different forage uh, quantities or qualities, how do you deal with consistency and the quality of the product, both in terms of dairy and in terms of beef? And how do you uh, manage that in terms of marketing? If you might see some variance in uh, the overall product that ends up, how do you communicate with your consumers or your, uh, your primary audiences to help them understand why there may be variable uh, variability within the product. So Adam and Doran, do you want to take that one on first? And then maybe Rod, you can chime in at the end and share a little bit from the beef perspective. Well, I can take a shot at it and then I'll let Doran add on. I mean, all our dairy producers get paid um, based on the components of their milk. And that's probably the driving factor for, you know, um, what they're going to shoot for in terms of their their pay price and premiums. Um, so we pay on butter, fat, protein, and other solids. Um, the grass fed is sort of an on top of that um, offering, as Darren outlined, um, uh, four dollars uh, premium. In terms of uh, you know the milk is uh, we see variability in even in our existing milk, but um, I'd say it's pretty consistent overall. There can sometimes be slight flavor. Um, tones that are different and in grass products the flavor tones are different generally I mean you just would notice that if you had a um, grass milk versus another milk and some people find that very preferable and others are less inclined I don't know Doran if you have anything to add in terms of the variability of the landscapes uh, that we work well, that, that was good uh, explanation or answer and I would just add that you know we we produce we we process regionally and you know, we cope pack with 90 plus plants around the country even though we we ourselves only own one or two or three um but when it comes to fluid milk or whatever it could be a cheese or yogurt it's done regionally so it tends to be if it's the northwest part of the united states or the midwest or the northeast that you know the, the things unique to that area are going to be in that area it's going to be produced there processed there sold there and consumed there so it's going to be, you know, it's going to be consistent in that area. Um, so uh, people probably wouldn't notice much. Very, there, there's not going to be a variance noticed by the consumers or you know the buyers hearing something like that, like a maybe like a complaint or a question or anything. If that helps. 
It does. Rod, do you have uh, some perspectives on this in terms of uh, the, co the beef co-op? Yeah, absolutely. So we started, Pete, uh, uh, the first one or two years of the beef co-op was all kumbaya, take any grass-fed beef, it's all great. Uh, and we quickly found out uh, we were actually lucky to survive that all grass-fed beef is not created equally. And what you had is some was grass-starved beef and they fed it grass all year long and thought that was enough. And you had other folks that did it extremely, extremely well. So that not only the taste profile was better uh, in addition to all the uh, human health benefits, but uh, it was just an excellent eating experience. So we quickly went from one pay price to two to three to four, and we now have five. Similar to what our OV uh, brethren are doing based on, they're doing it based on their probably amino acid, CLA, omega-6, omega-3 profile. We do it based on your USDA uh, finish. So if you finish in a choice, you get a, 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 a the highest price. If you finish high select, it's a very good price. If you finish mid select, it's a good price. And if you start getting to the area where we may need to grind some of those cuts, or it's not going to be a top end eating experience, I don't want to say we use the stick, but we have some small carrots, some bigger carrots, and some really big carrots uh, based on your performance. So that's what we've learned over time. Those incentives really drive uh, good quality performance. Great, great responses. Thank you both for that. That's uh, or all three of you. That was, um, that was it's helpful to answer that question. Um, we are, you know, moving closer to time, but we do uh, finishing. But we want to make sure that we get to a couple more questions here. There was a question, and I think this could be, you know, again applicable to both the beef and dairy. Uh, so it'd be good to get uh, uh, feedback. Maybe uh, stick with you, Rod, and get your perspective, and then we'll shift back to Adam Doran uh, to to ask about. Some practices uh, on uh, with cattle in terms of worming, and uh, how do you handle uh, a worming program while also managing your customers' expectations in terms of the practices being used, and uh, what restrictions do you put in place, and how do you, uh, or if at all, do you communicate uh, how things might need to change and how practices might be, need to be used from time to time to your consumers? Brad, you want to start? Do you us want off me first? Yeah, yeah, sure. So that was the clarification of the question. Would be, that was a worming. That's right. A clarification on your worming program and how you communicate right. when that's necessary uh, to your consumers. Yeah. Okay. So, what we our commitment is that we never have any pesticides or herbicides. So that says there's no deworming involved. For our first eight years in our program, we were organic certified. So we also used, there was a pyganic, a de, uh, uh, organic, wasn't a dewormer per se, but a, a more of a pesticide and uh, an organic certified pesticide. But there are no that I know of other than cattle finding their own uh, plants that are an organic pesticide. So uh, dewormers are not allowed. That was probably the last crutch that took me to get away from. But uh, if you can't live without it, uh, you've got other issues, uh, I can say, as being an experience. And secondly, dewormers are really only, even in the conventional industry, required for cows that are, you know, of long length and life and have maybe issues with body condition over the winter. Um, you should never, ever need dewormers on, you know, young cattle that are finishing in 18 to 28 months. So I guess that's my inputs. Great. Doran, Adam, do you have any insights? Sure. Uh, Adam, you want to say something, or I'll say some things. You you better. Okay. Well, the biggest thing with uh, uh, de deworming or, or just having a low parasite load, because we really don't need to. The idea is there is no deworming that needs to happen. You just you have a low, if almost non-existent parasite load, by good managed grazing. Which means taller grazing, you know those those the, the the larvae for those worms, you know creep their way up from the ground uh, as dew is on the ground, and then as the dew, um, you know, is burned off, they will start to go back down towards the the soil, and so the key is is don't graze things down so low that uh, your animals are going to be eating uh, the larvae that are going to give them worms. The other thing too would be obviously is you know is to be moving them and giving that pasture a long rest time, but taller grazing can't emphasize it enough. 
and also for calves, you know, to keep the worms out of your calves at an early age. Well, one thing, of course, is longer, uh, you know, don't wean them so soon. We were encouraged long period of time that cattle are, or that uh, young stock are, are, are on milk. And then when they are grazing, that they are moved. And they're in taller grass, not too tall, but taller grass. And they are not in the same area all the time with your young stock, which tends to be be a problem on farms that young stock, well, they go there. And that's their pasture. Oh, it's five acres over there. Well, then you get a big worm load in that area, and you want to keep moving them around to fresh fresh ground. And there are things like diatomaceous earth and stuff that can be fed, but it's it just isn't all that necessary if you manage your pasture as well. Excellent. Thanks, Doran. That's helpful. And, and thanks also, Rod, for, for the input on that. Um, we are coming up close uh, to the end of time, but we do have one last question here that we'll throw in. And I have a feeling, Doran, this is directed towards you and uh, that you were talking a little bit about uh, uh, grain and seed heads. Uh, the question from this audience member is, can you cut barley in the soft dough stage? And I'm assuming that means, is that still, uh, does that still right. qualify? Yeah, that's a good question. We get asked that uh, for whatever reason, somebody might be wanting to grow something and and that is allowed, but I don't, it just really doesn't happen much. But apparently, yeah, whether it, you know, there's male sterile corn, uh, you know, or corn in the dough stage or below that. But then the question is your tonnage, you know, um, you know, it seems like you're leaving a lot on the table as far as what there could be. So it, it can be done, I guess, but it's, uh, and maybe Adam can clarify on it if he knows more. My understanding is it can be done, but I don't see it happening um, out in the field. And, and while I just have the microphone, I just want to just give a word of encouragement to everybody that, and I think about, you know, I kind of come up with my own little question or theoretical, hypothetical, or not hypothetical, but rhetorical question is, what other animal can you manage around your farm with one wire? You know, it's nice to have a good perimeter fence, but isn't it, aren't cattle wonderful in that if you move them every day, whether it's a heifer, a group of heifers, they can be young or older, if you, if you move that fence every day for them, what a great routine they get into, and you can manage that, that group of animals with just one wire. You can't do that with goats, chickens, pigs, you know, horses, whatever, you, you can't. But you can do it with cattle, and aren't they wonderful? I just want to encourage all the young new producers that uh, it's a great life and enjoy it, and good luck to you. Yeah, thanks, Doran. That's actually a really good, uh, great, great spot to end on uh, as we as we wrap up here. Um, and wanted to say thank you to all of the presenters, Rod, Adam, and Doran. Thank you for uh, all the information and for taking uh, quite a range of questions there and responding so eloquently. And also, just want to thank everyone who has joined us tonight. Some contact information. Again, uh, these are the three uh, experts that have joined us. And uh, they're wealth of information and provide uh, quite a bit of uh, expertise. And I know that they're, uh, they're great guys that are more than happy to help folks out as they're figuring things out. So some emails there for Rod, Adam, and Dorn. Uh, feel free to reach out. Of course, my email is at the top as well, uh, Pete Huff at Winrock. And you can uh, reach out, and I'm more than help, happy to help uh, direct you to someone if you don't know who you need to be directed to. Uh, I'm always happy to help out in that regard. Also, just would encourage you to spend some time checking out uh, the Pasture Project's website, as well as uh, Wisconsin Meadows' website. Uh, and then, of course, Organic Valley has a great website with great information and great resources. But with that, we will wrap up for the evening. We are just at 8.30. want to say thank you again to the presenters and also say thank you to everyone who attended uh, tonight's Pasture Project webinar. And we wish you the best of luck uh, with the good work that you're doing or plan to do. And we look forward to seeing you at a future webinar or hopefully in a pasture somewhere uh, in our future events. Thanks, everyone. Have a good evening.